I repent, I receive, I'm refreshed. You look like it. You look like it. Just shake someone's hand close to you. It's good to be in the house of the Lord together in the presence of a good God that loves us and wants to do good things in us and through us. And I know some of us are maybe are had a sore day. Bah. Some of us have had some, some ick trying to get to us and, uh, and yet we're here and I appreciate that. I, I, I want you to know I, I'm always um, honored to be able to worship the Lord together with you and his presence. Um, and uh, I encourage you to be praying uh, for Sunday morning, of course, and, and uh, we have a Sunday night service presentation. Next uh, Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock, we have our Christmas Eve service that the message gets through, not just the feeling, but the message uh, that what God wants to speak into people's hearts. They'll be receptive. They'll be here, and they'll be receptive to what the Lord wants to do. Um, I, Sunday we shared on joy and um, I, I got some of Crossman and, and, and was praying for tonight and just feel like we need to, to connect with that a little bit more. Does anybody need just a little bit more joy in your life? It'd be alright if we just share on joy again tonight and uh, just to, to stir that up afresh on the inside of us. Um, we've been this week, I ask you to every day take Colossians chapter 1 verse 1 and be praying for yourself for joy and be praying for other believers um, be praying for Grandview that this is a joyful place. Um, and some of the things that are going on in the world around us aren't so, so nice. Um, I mean, terrible, terrible things. Just like the, the, the massacre there in those, that school over in, uh, in, in uh, Pakistan. Hundred and was a hundred and thirty some children killed um, by, by, it doesn't matter who by. Yeah, it's terrible. It's the devil. It's the devil that doing stuff, does stuff like that. And, and so it reminds us, the, the world that we're living in, it reminds us of the battle that we're in. And it reminds us that we've got to reach people because we don't, we don't know. We don't know. If you die, oh, you know, you go to heaven. Well, praise God. But, but we, you know, and I'm already, you know, anytime. Come quickly, Lord Jesus kind of thing. But, but we have a work that needs to be done before Jesus comes back or we go to be with him. And we need to do that work with joy in our lives. Jesus brought the joy with him when he came. Amen? Jesus brought the joy with him. Not just the joy of a child being born, but the Savior. We see Jesus in his whole life was full of joy. He, he spread joy where he went. He impacted this world with joy. He brought joy not to a joyful church service. He brought joy to a lost lonely, desperate world. He looked at the desperate state of humanity and he stepped into it with overflowing joy. Not just happiness, not just a smile on his face, but he had a supernatural force that was in him that was greater than the darkness and the depravity of the world that was around him so that everywhere he went, he brought the joy with him. In life. And folks, we need to make sure, especially as the church, as we're going forth in our witness, in the way we do ministry, that we understand we're bringing Jesus, and Jesus still brings the joy with him when he comes. And so that there's a joy about us, a joy in our church, a joy in our worship, a joy in our service. Even in the sacrifice, there's a joy in it. Not that we enjoy pain, but we understand that what God has called us to do in this world, there's going to be struggles, there's going to be difficulties, but we can have the supernatural joy of the Lord. He brought the joy of forgiveness. Have you ever been forgiven of something? Doesn't that make you feel good? I don't like that word, but I don't know how else to say it. It makes me feel joyful. It makes me experience joy when I know that I've messed up, and I'm messed up before, Jay. And I mess up, and I go to God, and I say, please forgive me, and to sense his quick love reaching out to me, not a religion, not a, okay, I'll forgive you if you do these 10 things, but immediately the forgiveness that's already been accepted or given out to me, and I receive that in my life. There's a joy that is released in my life yet today. Joy needs to be a part of our lives when we're forgiving one another. There needs to be the joy of miracles. Church, I know you're a Wednesday night group, and we may be few, but there was only 12, and they turned the world upside down. We can do it, but we need the joy of miracles. 
We need miracles. We need miracles working in people's lives. And Jesus brought the joy when he went around. He didn't just give them compassion. He didn't just give them a pat answer. He didn't just tell them it'll be better when he gets to heaven. He brought better from heaven with him. And may the joy of Jesus stir in our lives so much that we start to bring the better of heaven into not just our lives, but as we start to reach out and, 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 and believe for God to do the supernatural, to start to expect the miraculous, to start to have a stirring of expectation on the inside of us and the joy that's involved in that in our lives. Jesus brought the joy with him and he put his joy in his church, the individual believers. The joy that God looked into the, the, the situation of mankind and demonstrated his great love. As followers of Jesus, we must be able to distinguish between supernatural joy compared to superficial happiness. Too many people are following after God as long as they're happy. But if that superficial happiness gets interrupted for some reason, there's an attack of the adversary. Somebody says something that they don't like. Some, some morning they wake up and they just don't feel it anymore. Have you ever woke up and just didn't feel it anymore? About every morning. <laughs> And that's when you need to tell yourself, I don't go by my feelings. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength. The Bible says that, 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 that I'm a part of the kingdom of God, which is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So I'm not waiting for a feeling. I'm telling myself, you're going to feel good because you are full of joy. You're going to feel good because you're forgiven. You're going to feel good because the word says so. And get up and go for it. We must make sure that we have the experience of the supernatural power of the joy of the Lord in our lives. Luke's gospel chapter 10, turn there if you would with me. We're going to look at a verse in just a moment. But I want, to, I want to understand that everything that you get from God, everything that you and I receive from the Lord, everything is connected to the heart of God. Everything that we get is connected to the relationship of a loving heavenly father. There's nothing you get because you've earned it. There's nothing you get because you're smart enough for it. You know, I was just thinking about this today. Side note, but I, it, it's worth mentioning, I believe. Because if we're not careful, we get caught up. Well, I get joy if I can quote three scriptures and then put a smile on my face and talk myself into it. We get joy not because of what we, not because we're knowing more and doing more. It's because, because God loves us. Because God loves us. And if we're not careful, we get on a track of just trying to learn more and think if we just know more, we'll have more. Isn't it amazing how little the disciples, the followers of Jesus when he was here on this earth for just three years, really how little they knew and how much they did and much of what they did is what we would like to do who actually know more than they did. Doesn't that sound interesting to you? I thought it was interesting. We see the disciples going around doing all kinds of amazing miracles and they didn't even know that Jesus was going to have to die and be raised again from the dead. The Pauline revelation that we know from Ephesians and from Colossians and from Philippians and some of them, they didn't know any of that. They didn't know the disciples that followed Jesus only knew a fraction of what you know. They didn't even have the New Testament. They didn't even have all of the word of God that you've got. And look at what they, they went around and did. They did what we'd like to do. Casting out devils, raising the dead, laying hands on the sick, stuff like that. Amen? Y'all in for that one? Yeah. So if we're not careful, we think that if we just learn more, we'll be able to do more. But really the connection is loving more. If we're not careful, the adversary slips in and he replaces a passion in our heart for knowledge in our head. And we know the right answers, but we don't see it happening and we get frustrated. And so we think we got to go, we got to learn more. We need to go to Bible school. Go to Bible school and figure out how much you don't know. Well, now I need to go to seminary. 
You go to seminary and you find out, man, I don't know Hebrew that well or Greek that well. I need to go get my master's degree. And then I need to go get my doctor's degree. And then I, by the time I do all that, most times people don't believe in miracles even more. And so now we know why they don't happen. And yet, you have people to just have a passion, a love, a love for God and a love for people. You see, Jesus, don't, don't, don't analyze this too much or criticize it too much. Jesus did not come to inform us about God. He came to show us how much God loved us. He didn't come to just give us information. He came to share with us how much God loves us. Sinners, lost, lonely, helpless. And he said, God loves you so much, he wants to do the greatest miracle ever. He wants to forgive you of your sin. He wants to come and live on the inside, recreate you on the inside, and make you his children. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? And how many of you have experienced that in your life? And you did that knowing probably maybe one verse. You see, it wasn't how much you knew to cause the greatest miracle in your life. It's that you experienced the love of God, which transformed your life. So as we're going forward here and we're talking about the joy of the Lord, folks, please don't get it over just in, into the knowledge. Don't get it over into just the logic of it. Don't get it over in just how many scriptures that you can quote and how many experiences that you can remember from the Bible. Please always ground it in the love of God. What should bring joy into your, world, into your life? God loves me. God loves me. And because of that, it's going to bring joy into me. And if he loves me, that love starts to increase so much that God loves everyone. And that joy overflows and should be impacting other people's lives. Now, here in Luke's Gospel 10, I'm sure you got there by now, this really should be an average church service for us. Not just an informational time, but we should have an exper ex experiential time. Amen? Too many times we've come and taken notes, but we haven't had our lives changed or pe brought people that needed changed. You see, you're all in good shape. No one here needs any transformation in your life. You're all just, just super good shape. You don't need any transformation. But there's other people that do, you understand. Here in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, let's start reading here. Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, at verse 17. You'll go down a little bit. I'm going to read out the Amplified. It's going to have some other words expanded a little bit. But we're talking about Jesus brought the joy with him. The name of Jesus, not just the person, not just the presence, but what he represents, the authority that he brings. The authority that he brings into this world. Here in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 17, this is before the resurrection, the disciples that were following Jesus... In verse 17, and the 70 returned. We don't even know all these people's names. You know, we know the, the 12 that followed after him. We know the three that was closest to him. We know the one that he was closest with. But here we have the 70, Deborah, that we don't even know most of these people's names. And yet, listen to what some of these people, that we don't even know their names, that, that, that didn't have all the learning that you know, look what happened in their life. It, it says here in verse 17, the 70 returned with what? Joy. They returned with joy. Amen? They returned from joy. Not from a joyful church service, you understand. They were out there on the highways and the byways. Not, not a joyful coming together in a, in a retreat somewhere where they isolated themselves from all the infidels of the world and the pagans of the world. But they went out in the world. The world that was lost and lonely. And they went out into the world and they returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject unto your name. They weren't saying we had great church services. They didn't say because everybody followed after us. They understood the authority that is in the name of Jesus. Has the name of Jesus changed today? No. So there should still be great joy because of the name of Jesus. Demons still have to succumb to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is before the resurrection. So it's even more true for us today. Verse 18, it says, And he, he said unto them, I saw Satan fall like uh, lightning flashes from heaven. Behold, I have given unto you authority and power to trample upon serpents and scorpions and physical and mental strength and ability over all the power of the enemy possesses. Isn't that great? That he even tells these disciples, because he had bequeathed them, given him his name to use, 
He has given them the authority, the ability, the power to supersede any authority of the enemy. He's not just talking about just spiders and snakes and stuff like that here. He's talking about representing the enemy and any type of attack that the enemy would come against them with. They have authority. How? In the name of Jesus. I love following Jesus because he keeps it simple. It wasn't because you had all of these scrolls that you had to memorize. Now, I think memorizing the word of God is good and important. But he's not saying you, gotta, it's not, you don't have to pass some advanced class to be able to take authority over the devil. You just got to know the name of Jesus. And when you use the name of Jesus, it brings joy into the situation. He goes on here in verse 20. And he says to them, nevertheless, nevertheless. Now, he didn't, it's not an either-or thing here. He's saying, that's good, that's great, but there's something even greater that should cause joy in your life. And nevertheless, he says, do not rejoice at this. He's not saying that you shouldn't rejoice over miracles and people being set free, but he's saying there's a greater, greater reason. He said, nevertheless, rejoice not at this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your name is enrolled in heaven. Amen. On your worst day, on your worst day, you should be able to rejoice. My name is written in heaven. My name is written on the roll in heaven. My name is written. Now listen to me. Notice the connection here. In the name of Jesus, they had authority on this earth. They understood the significance of what a name represented. They understood the significance meant as good as that person being there. You remember when you were growing up, and you know, I don't know about in your family, but my family, when I was growing up, I was the the youngest, I was the smallest, but all I had to say was, mom said, and it was just as if mom was right there with me, ready to back it up. If mom said I could go, I can go whether you want me to go or not, with my older brothers or sister, I'm going to go. If mom said I could do it, then I could do it. Mom said. She wasn't there, but when I used, in a sense, that title... It gave me the same authority. Not only do we have the name of Jesus here, your name is written in heaven. It's as if you are already there. It's as if you're already there. And the enemy can't take your name off the roll. And God doesn't want to. Amen? So we need to start to live out of that fresh enjoyment. You see, I'm not trying to earn my salvation. I'm not sweating it out until the end to see whether I'm going to... My name is written in, the, in, in, in heaven's role. Now, number one, I need to be acting like that. Huh? I need to be acting like my name's written up there, not down there. And when I realize my name's written in, the lamp, in heaven, when my name is written there, it's the same as me being there. It's the Father God's got a place for me, a preparation. He's got name tags on the, on the plates, you understand. And he is ready for me to be there. It's as if I am there. Then we should start living out. That's joy in my life. I don't have to wonder if I'm going to make it or not. I don't have to wonder if the devil's going to take me out or not. I don't wonder if St. Peter's going to let me in or not because I know my name's written in, the, in heaven. So uh, it brings joy into my life, and that should be the greatest reason for us to rejoice in our life. Does that cause you to rejoice? Above all the prayers being answered in your life, above all the things that are going on in your life, that should be the top one. That's the number one reason to rejoice in our life. Jesus is... Jesus tells his followers to have joy because of the supernatural truth that is not based on this world. Now, I know your lives. I know we've all been through struggles. We're all, some of us are going through struggles. I know life is tough at times, difficult at times, physical problems, financial problems, marital problems, uh, mental problems, uh, family problems, all kinds of problems. We got problems, amen? We're blessed with problems, aren't we? And we can, we can look in, into our lives in the natural and say, it's so difficult. But when we realize that our name is written in heaven, I have something to rejoice over in my life. Regardless of the problems that I'm going through in life. Jesus reminds us, reminds us that our, that our true joy is based on a spiritual truth, a supernatural truth, not on just something of this world. Let me ask you real quickly, how's your joy level? How is your joy level? 
Do you need to stir that up again afresh on the inside of you? Are you looking for just some manifestations to bring joy in your life? Are you looking for a fresh experience, another miracle, or God to do something bigger and better next time? I'm all about miracles. As I said, I want miracles to happen in Jesus' name. But folks, if we don't keep connected to where our name is, we're going to start looking around here for just some something supernatural to entice us, something supernatural. Remember, if you'll remember, uh, Herod wanted, uh, um, uh, the ruler at the time wanted Jesus to come up to him because he wanted just to see some miracles. This isn't some freak show. Right? This, is, this shouldn't be just us coming together just to, to, to see something wild and crazy happen. We should be following after Jesus. And signs and wonders should follow in our lives. But, but, but we're not going to be only following God when we're having a good time. We're going to follow him all the time. Is joy something that continues to be spoken of on the church? Peter. You remember Peter? The, he was the one that was head of the church in Jerusalem. Turn over, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 1. We see Jesus told his followers to have, to have joy in their lives. Spiritual joy. Joy, joy is a characteristic of the believer and should be a characteristic of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It should be. It should be. And it only is when we, when we receive that joy afresh in our lives and maintain it in our lives. Now here Peter encourages believers to have an expectation of the return of Jesus and to be full of joy because of that. We're looking to either go be with him or for him to come and, and to take us to be with him. But there should be an expectation We've seen, you know, this time of the year, we've got kids especially looking forward to Christmas coming. Boy, there's an expectation, isn't there? There's a joy that builds on the inside of them and thinking about what it's going to be like. Jesus is coming back someday, folks. Jesus is coming back someday. There should be a joyful expectation on the inside of us. There should be a stirring on the inside of us of the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. We should be focused on Jesus' second coming, and that produces a joy in our heart. Well, Pastor, I, you know, they've been preaching his return for a long time. That's right, and we're getting closer and closer to his return. But is it an expectation in you? Is it something that you are just putting off? Or is it a stirring expectation in you? Listen to what the Word of God says here. First Peter, First Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says... You love him even though you have never seen him. He is writing to a group of people that didn't, that, that didn't see the Messiah when he was on this earth. He's writing to a group of people that didn't see Jesus do, going around doing the miracles. And yet they believed and they received him as their savior. He said you've never seen him. Though you did not see him now, you trust in him. This is all of us, you understand. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. Let me ask you, does the church look like that today? Paul said, or excuse me, Peter said here that we should be, have an inexpressible joy, an unspeakable joy, a, a, a joy that is beyond the ability to fully articulate, but we should try anyway. A joy that cannot be just said, I'm joyful, but it, it is so all-consuming. It, 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 it comes from deep on the inside of us. It affects uh, the way we think. It affects the way we talk. It affects the way we pray. It affects the way we live. It's inexpressible in the sense that it can't be fully expressed. It's unexplainable in the sense that there's no way to, to tell you all about it, and yet it should be something that should be seen in our lives. He's saying here there is an inexpressible joy the reward for trusting him while, while will be the salvation of your soul when we're trusting in the Lord's coming again when we're trusting in Christ's return for us there should be in our lifestyle an inexpressible unexpeakable joy unspeakable and full of glory come on you can sing it with me if you want to but joy unspeakable and full of the glory of the Lord that's the way we should be living our lives Tyndale's commentary says that it is possible for us while we're still here on this earth to get a taste of what the world to come is to be like because of this salvation. This joy that comes into our lives is a taste of what heaven is going to be like. Isn't that amazing? 
That we, the church, are not to sit and to, to mourn the death of our Savior. The church is not to sit in hiding for hopefully the rescue of the Messiah someday from in, our, in our dark world. We are supposed to be this outgoing expression of what the world to, that, that we are going to experience is like. There is to be a joy in us that is supernatural, that is not of this world. It is a foretaste. Of what is to come. Anybody here ever went through Sam's Club on, is it, is it, I forget what day it is, when you go uh, Fridays or whenever, and they have the tasters out there, and people out there frying up little stuff, and you go by and, you know, you get something, and then you send the kids by, get something for you, and then you, you know, I mean, it, they have the things out there, what are they, they, they give you a little sample to taste what the product is, because they want you to buy the product. In one sense, joy is a taste of what Jesus has bought for us. It is, it's a free sample, if you would, of the salvation. It is a reminder that no matter how compressed this life gets, no matter how much the devil attacks your life, he can't keep you from that joy. He can't stop it from happening in your life. Peter is reminding the believers, all of us, every single one of us, that there is a joy that is available to us and it is a foretaste of what is God's desire in our life. Are you living with that joy in your life? You might say, Pastor, I don't have that joy right now. There's a scripture, you can just write it down, meditate on it, think about it later, just write the reference. But it's an Old Testament, I want to take the time to turn Isaiah 12, 3. It should be on the screen and back of me in a, in a moment, if not now. Isaiah says, with joy you will drink deeply from the fountain of salvation. Can you for just a moment get a picture of this? To be in a hot, dry country, a climate that... Water is not something that, that is often seen, especially clear, drinkable water. And then you come into one of those oases. And there they'll have one of those, those wells that have been dug by someone else, already prepared. It's a deep well, an artesian well. The water even that, that is deep down in there, it's deep, it's clear, it's cool and refreshing. And even though out here it's, there's dry, uh, hot sand and not much else around you, there's an, an abundance of this water underneath. Life. And when you draw from that deep well, it's salvation to you. Without it, you die. And this water that comes up you understand, it's not some muddy, murky thing that's full of all kinds of bacteria and all kinds of stuff. It's immediately drinkable, cool, and refreshing. Draw deeply from the well of your salvation. And when you do, there is a joy in your life. There's a refreshing in your life. There is, there's life that comes to you from, from that well. There's an appreciation that you didn't have to dig that well. It, Jesus went before you and made provision for you. That we are to, to, with joy, draw from that well. A fool would go to that well and say, oh, I got I to draw from all the way down there. I got I to pull all that rope up to be able to get that water. A fool would say, I just want to turn the spigot and just let it squirt out on me. But a wise man realizes a deep well means it's going to be clear, it's going to be refreshing, and there's going to be an abundance of it. And they draw with joy out of it. You're going to go through some days. It seems going to be dry and difficult. And part of you are going to stop and say, God, I just wish this would best be easier for me. But you're wise ones. You're wise men and women. And you realize I'm going to draw from this deep well of my salvation. And I know that the refreshing is going to be joyful. It's going to be pure. There's going to be an abundance of it. 
that's going to bring refreshing into my life. Because that's the well. That's the provision that God has for me. It's been available to us. That's the kind of salvation that God has given to us. This, this salvation that goes beyond just I get to go to heaven when I'm saved, but I get a foretaste of that salvation here, that joy. What was the joy that was released in the ministry of Jesus? When he forgave people of their sins, there was joy. When people were healed, there was joy. When people were delivered, there was joy. Jesus doesn't want you just to have a positive attitude. He wants you to have a foretaste of heaven. He wants us to have miracles in our lives. He wants us to be forgiven and forgive others supernaturally. He wants us to be healed in our bodies. He wants us to be delivered. He wants us to cast out devils. He wants us to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. That's a joyful experience. That's a taste of salvation that comes from heaven that's already been paid for and there's nothing the devil can do to stop it when we draw from that well in our lives. We take this beyond just a positive way of life to an experience of drawing some of heaven into this world here and now just like the disciples did. That's what he's calling us to do. Quickly, Philip who went and shared Jesus over in Acts chapter 8. We've got Jesus talked about joy. We've got the, the head of the church at the beginning with uh, Peter in Jerusalem and that talked about joy. Now we've got Philip here in Acts chapter 8. Hopefully we're all getting a little bit joyful tonight. And Acts chapter 8 where Philip, Philip wasn't one of the 70. Philip wasn't one of the 12. Philip wasn't some big shot. Philip wasn't an apostle. Philip wasn't somebody that had a title. Philip was a believer. Any believers in the house tonight? What did Philip do in a very inconvenient time? Philip shared Jesus with others, and because of that, he spread the good news of Jesus, but also Jesus still brought the joy with him. Here in Acts chapter 8, let's just start reading in verse 3. But Saul, this is of course before his conversion. So Saul was still uh, uh, persecuting the church. Verse 3, but Saul was, was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison because they were followers of Jesus. These were difficult days. Now, I don't know about you, uh, you know, my family, when I was young, we went through some difficult times, and we had some people knocking on the doors that weren't there to share the love of Jesus with us, and had some bills that needed to be paid, and sometimes we had lights, and sometimes we didn't, and sometimes we had gas for heat, and sometimes we didn't. And, and I know that there's time, but we never had anybody come into my house to drag us out. I can't imagine the, you know, women, children. We had that video not long ago of that, the uh, believers in Syria, that uh, the, the, the Muslims came in and, and, and killed them. It's basically the same spirit working through Saul here. Going into people's houses. You see, this is not a convenient time to be a follower of Jesus. So what did, what did Philip do with all of this persecution going on? Verse 4, but the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Now, I know that I'm almost out of time tonight, but I need to tell you, church, if it becomes illegal, you still preach Jesus. If it comes down to being persecution in your life, you still preach Jesus. When it comes down to them taking your property, you still preach Jesus. When it comes down to them hurting you physically, you still preach Jesus. When it comes down to giving your life, you still preach Jesus because we've only got a better place to go to, but still people need to hear Jesus. We see the church was birthed by the Holy Spirit, but it was encouraged and empowered by the Spirit that during difficult times, we've got enough joy to still preach Jesus to the world that is around us. And we don't wait for a more convenient time or a more comfortable time to be able to share this message of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have, we have given up too much in the cause of convenience. We have let too much slip through our hands. Too many generations have come and gone. But we have drawn back because we didn't know it was convenient. We might be, might, what if they take our tax exemption from us? Well, folks, they take our tax exemption from us. They take it from us, but we still got to preach Jesus. Now, I'm not trying to get some military group going here and being some kind of militants and we're not going to start dressing in camouflage and, you know, and uh, doing some crazy thing, but we need to have some courage in us. 
Well, pastor, what if, what if I get in trouble at my job for preaching Jesus? Well, if you're living for Jesus and got the joy of the Lord in your life, if you get in trouble, you get in trouble. But I mean, don't be a dumb believer, but be a wise one. Wise as serpent and harmless as doves. They're following Jesus. But the believers that were scattered preached the good news about Jesus everywhere they went. Philip, for example. Here's an example of a believer. Just an average believer. You understand? Just an average believer. Here's an example of a J. Here's an example of, a, of an art. Here's an example of a Kathy. For example, went to the city of Samaria. Samaria, remember those were the half-breeds the Jews didn't like. The ones that they wondered whether or not they even had the right relationship with God or could ever have a right relationship. Went to Samaria and told the people there about Jesus, the Messiah. Crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous. God help us to preach the message and also to see the miraculous, to confirm that message. They were eager to, to hear the message and to see the miraculous signs he did. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left the victims. And many who had been paralyzed and lame were made, he were made healed, were healed. Verse 8, so there was great joy in the city. Preaching Jesus, Jesus still brings the joy. There was great joy in the city. Now we drop down here, verse 12, it goes on and says, uh, but, but now the people believe Philip's uh, message of God's the good news concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. As a result, many men and women were baptized. Thank God that Jesus still ministers and delivers and sets free today. But how are people going to be set free unless they hear about Jesus? How are we going to spread the joy? Philip spread the joy. Jesus, Jesus tells us that we are to, to follow after him with joy in our lives. We are then told to have personal joy with Jesus. We're just going to have to wrap it up here. We're running out of time tonight. Jesus told us that we are supposed to receive the joy of our salvation. Personally. Personally, we are to be filled with joy. An expectation of his return. That's what, what Peter said. Personally, we should be sharing Jesus with others. That spreads the joy. That's what happened with Philip. So the personal involvement that we have is so important in our lives. Have you received Jesus in your life? Then you've got the joy. You've got it. You've got it. You've got a foretaste, Peter says. Have you received that joy? Then are you starting to, to be based on the focus that, that that joy becomes of my relationship with Jesus. I'm focused on that relationship of Jesus and his name in my life and my name being already written down there. Am I spreading the joy? Are you spreading the joy? Well, Pastor, I don't know if I can buy enough Christmas gifts for everybody this year. It ain't got anything to do about Christmas gifts. It ain't got anything to do about Christmas cards. It ain't got anything to do about this time of the year. It's about Jesus, 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 Jesus in our life. And spreading the joy, the good news about Jesus. Jesus is the main attraction in the church. He's the main focus in our lives. And he has not changed one bit. He brings joy still today if we'll have the courage and the boldness to share him with others. You know, I thought tonight if I brought one of those little helium tanks and filled up a balloon, I wouldn't sweat it at all if I let that balloon go and it would fly. It's not my responsibility to make it fly. And you know what? Sharing Jesus with others, it's not your responsibility to get people saved. It's not your responsibility to get people healed. It's not your responsibility to cast out devils. It's not your responsibility to raise the dead. It's not your responsibility to be able to forgive people. What it is your responsibility is, stay full of the joy of the Lord. And then you might start dying a little bit like this, but you get a little healing in you, and you become the balloon. You start to float. You start to be a manifestation of the presence of God in your life. It changes you. It transforms you. Church, we've got to have joy in our lives. And when we have the joy of the Lord in us, we don't sweat it. We don't have to make it. We trust in Him in our lives to be able to make it happen and share the power of his presence in our lives. Jesus is still good news. Stay connected with him. Stay full of his presence. And then start spreading it around. Start infecting others with the joy of Jesus. Amen.
You know somebody, and I'll close with this illustration, somebody at work or somebody around you, and they cough a little bit, and they say, don't, stay back, I don't want to infect you. Isn't that interesting? You don't have to do anything to be infected. You just got to be around somebody. Now, if a sickness could, in, could do that, how much more the joy of the Lord should be able to do that? That you could get around people and you could infect them with the joy of the Lord. Well, pastor, you don't know so-and-so. If a healthy person could be infected with a disease by someone else, I think a, an unhealthy spiritual person should be influenced by a healthy spiritual person. If it works one way in the natural, it works in a sense the same way in the supernatural. So will you all please go out into that world and infect them with the joy of the Lord? Get around them. Don't cough on them. But love on them. Respond not to them, but, but overcome evil with good to those that are, you are around. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your divine presence. And God, there's more that could have been said and maybe should have been said tonight. But your word has spoken to us. You've challenged us. You've reminded us that this is not about us. It's about Jesus. It's not about us being happier. It is about you experiencing your supernatural joy. And if, and if in the situations Philip could go and spread joy... God, in our world today, we can spread that joy too. Jesus has not changed and your joy has not changed. And so, Lord, give us those divine opportunities that we might influence the world around us with, with your supernatural power. Thank you for heaven. Thank you for Jesus, our Savior, who's made a way. And Lord, right now, we, we just simply receive forgiveness and we receive Jesus afresh in our lives. And we thank you for the joy of the Lord. And God, again, we just agree for these services that are in the next week here, that as people come, many times individuals that don't normally come to church, that we would be able to share this good message of Jesus in their lives. And that they'll be able to understand it and receive it and be transformed by it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.